When people look at modern Middle Eastern history, they tend to begin at the end of the First World War and draw every subsequent problem to the Sykes-Picot Agreement. This was when the British and French divided up the Middle East between themselves, and this, along with their other colonies, placed most of the Islamic world under European rule. However, like with most other simplistic explanations, it often ignores all of the history of the region and its peoples. After all, the huge Muslim empires, which once owned everything from the gates of Vienna to the borders of China, were completely divided by numerous religious sects and ethnicities. For instance, various Persian dynasties were based on different ethnic groups, like the Afsharids, while over in Afghanistan, the Pashtuns created the Durrani Empire. Or in many Middle Eastern countries, they'd be ruled over by a mix of foreign slave soldiers or even converts. Like many of the rulers of North Africa were Mamluks from Georgia, or even the governors of Algiers and the likes were more often than not converts from Europe, such as Mezo Morto Hussein Pasha, who was from Mallorca. And more often than not, power would be fought over between these foreigners, while the larger Arab populations were ignored. But even within the Arab populations, they too can be divided into various groups, like the sedentary groups in the cities and the Bedouin, who for simplicity's sake, we'll just call nomadic Arabs. Plus there are the tribes, which are almost too innumerable to count. Then if you were to zoom into some areas, you could find even more subdivisions, like in Iraq, where there's the Marsh Arabs. They live, as the name suggests, in the Mesopotamian marshes, and their origin is pretty much a complete mystery. Some claim they came from India, while others say they were pre-Islamic Arabs, known as the Nabataeans. Whatever the case may be, there used to be up to 8 million of them in Iraq in the middle of the 20th century, but have suffered from a great deal of persecution. To further complicate matters, to even refer to Arabs as an ethnic group is somewhat controversial. It's probably best to describe them as more of a cultural group, a loose collection of people who all share a similar language. For instance, there are Arab groups living in southern Iran known as the Huwala. They were Arabs who migrated to Persia in the 15th century and formed a sizable chunk of the population. But they began to marry the locals and created a unique group of Iranian Arabs. Many other groups were Arabized, with maybe no real genealogical link to the Arabian Peninsula. Many people in what we would call Arabic countries recognise this problem. For instance, in the early 20th century in Egypt, there were two movements. One in which saw people identify themselves as Arabs, but there was another, known as Pharaonism. Here they argued that they were unique in the Middle East, with stronger ties to their ancient past rather than anything Arabic. Similar movements took place across the region, like in Lebanon, where some wanted to promote Phoenicianism. Or, in later history, Saddam Hussein often portrayed himself as a Babylonian ruler, not necessarily an Arab. But all of these types of nationalism came about very recently, and in many regards it's easy to see why. Many of the Arabian people were ruled over by foreigners, like Turkish, Georgian and even Albanian. Many Arabs could be black-skinned, while others were white. Many speak different types of Arabic, and possibly more important than anything, they're more likely to identify with their tribe. But first I'd like to thank Aura for sponsoring this video. Are you tired of constantly receiving spam phone calls, to the point where you don't even answer your phone anymore? Well, Aura is here to help. Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers and others who want to learn more about you, like where you live. Well, Aura can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. These brokers are actually legally required to remove your information if you ask them to, they just make it incredibly hard to do so. So, Aura will do it for you. It's really easy to set up, and you can get it for an incredibly reasonable price. So, let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online, while you get on with your life. Don't let people continue exploiting and profiting from your private information, go to aura.com slash jabsy. There, if you're from the USA, you can start your two-week free trial today, and you can take a look if your personal information has been compromised. Again, that's aura.com slash jabsy. But now, let's get back to the video. Many of the most influential tribes, at least in early times, had some sort of connection to the Prophet's family, and tradition dictates you could divide them into groups, which they call skulls. But each of these has various offshoots, each living in different regions, and sometimes they settle down, 
while other times they remained nomadic. Just as one example, there's the Bani Utba, a tribal confederation in the early modern period. Their ancestors were expelled from Iraq by the Ottomans because they kept on attacking caravans. They moved to Kuwait and some continued on to Najd and then Qatar. Various tribes united again to help fight on both sides of conflicts between the Persians and Oman. Then, in the late 18th century, they took over Bahrain for themselves, and the ruling family of Bahrain comes from this tribe. So too in fact does the House of Sabah, the ruling family in Kuwait. This complicated history is true for most of the ruling families and the tribes. Like in 1833, 800 members of the Bani Yas tribe conquered Dubai, and their tribe became the ruling house of Maktoum. Or take the example of Shamar. They migrated from Yemen to Jebel Shamar. There they formed an alliance of sorts with the Ottomans. But some migrated even further as far north as Mosul, often displacing the other tribes that lived within Iraq. And recently, they've even formed their own militia to protect their tribe against ISIS. So the Ottoman Empire had to deal with all sorts of tribal conflicts. Like in 1757, when the Bani Sakur tribe killed 20,000 pilgrims on their way back from Mecca. So the Ottomans would often play tribe against tribe, maintaining some sort of disorder along their borders. For instance, they sometimes sided with the Al Muntafiq against the Shamar. This tribe, the Al Muntafiq on the east of Arabia, was a mix of Sunni and Shia, but their tribal identity was far greater than their religious differences. Another important tribe was the Banu Hashim, who, ever since the Ottoman conquest of the Mamluks, were granted control over Mecca. They therefore became the Sharifs of the city, and later would be tapped to be the unifiers of Arabia, and created the Hashemite dynasty. But they were not even the most powerful tribe in Arabia. The House of Saud, for instance, was part of the larger Banu Hanifa tribe, and they would launch unification campaigns, following the incredibly strict Wahhabi sect. They made alliances with the Bani Yas in the UAE, and both were enemies of other tribes and nations, like the Omani and the Shamar in the north, or even the Al Muntafiq in the east. So to assume had Britain and France granted all of Arabia to the Hashemites, then peace would reign, well, that would only make sense if you completely ignore the huge tribal differences in Arabia. And that's just the Arab tribes. On top of that, you had tribes of Armenians, Kurdish, and even Turkic tribes in Anatolia. While over in Persia, Turkic tribes like the Qajars would take power and form their own ruling dynasty. Or before them, there was the Zan dynasty, which was created by a lackey speaking Kurdish tribe. At various times in Arabian history, you can pluck out a nation created by a tribe, and within a hundred years or so, they'd be ousted by a tribe that had migrated from completely different areas. Like before the Bani Utba came into the Gulf region, that area was controlled by the Bani Khalid Emirate for around 130 years, from 1669 to 1799. This meant for the longest time, the idea of a nation state could not have been cultivated. Even the idea of an Arab nation was a pretty recent creation. Some put the beginning of Arab nationalism to Napoleon's invasion of Egypt and the rise of Muhammad Ali Pasha, but he was an Albanian and never really pushed for the idea of Arab unity. Most of the Arab nationalist groups, like the Young Arab Society, were formed only a couple years before World War I. This society, which met in Paris, was made up of intellectuals from cities, and in their first two years of operation, they only had five members. Then, at the Arab Congress, which only happened in 1913 in Paris, these intellectuals would meet the Arab League Society, and their founder, Rashid Ridda. He favoured forming a caliphate, not some sort of liberal Arabic state. And to complicate matters even further, many Arabs within the Ottoman parliament actually opposed the Ottoman constitution. But of course, many of the tribes didn't care about this congress in Paris, and spent most of their time fighting one another, like the Al-Fadan and the Rawala, who were at war with one another in the late 19th century. In the final years of the Ottoman Empire, reformers tried to finally exploit the resources of the region, and offered permanent control over land if the tribal leaders would settle down. Many in the Al Muntafiq tribe took up the offer and became incredibly rich landlords, renting out their new land for exploitation. So a great deal of Ottoman territory was still left inhabited by nomads. Modern day Jordan, for instance, was largely a Bedouin area, 
and their capital city of Amman was only really resettled after centuries of abandonment in 1878. And it wasn't Arabs that settled there, it was Circassians. These came from the Caucasus region and had largely escaped Russian genocide. Historian Salim Dengil describes this late Ottoman policy as borrowed colonialism, trying to civilize the people through missionaries and the creation of modern military units, like the Hamidai Light Cavalry Regiments. These were made up solely of Kurdish tribesmen, but they were only created in the 1890s. Their creation, however, caused further problems, as one of their roles was to collect taxes, and they would often act brutally when dealing with other tribes and ethnicities. These tribal divisions in the Middle East are still very important today. Like in the civil war in Yemen, you can really break down the conflict between different tribes. Or in Iraq, there was the al bu Nasir tribe from Tikrit. This small tribe of 35,000 or so historically were Bedouin shepherds. But this was the tribe that Saddam Hussein came from. Once he took power, most of the high-ranking people in the government came from this tribe, including Chemical Ali and most leaders of the Republican Guard. So, in short, the British and the French could well have divided the Middle East along tribal lines. But, as I mentioned before, most of these tribes were nomadic and moved from place to place. But, then again, you could try to divide up the Islamic world through religion. One of the most clear divisions is that between Sunni and Shia. To grossly oversimplify this division, they emerged after the death of the Prophet. Sunnis wanted Abu Bakr to rule after Muhammad, while the Sunni supported Ali, the Prophet's cousin. But, often ignored, there's actually a third major sect, known as the Abadis. They are actually the successors of an older sect known as the Qajarites. The Qajarites could be described as a group of early extremists. That supported Ali just like the Shia did. However, they refused to accept any peace made and the rise of the Umayyad Caliphate. They also believed that anybody who deviated from the ideal norms of behavior could no longer be called Muslims and were worthy of death. Well, the Abadis were a more moderate group that sort of branched out from the Qajarites. They still refused to accept the peace, but none of their extreme rules. Ibn Abad led the moderates from Basra, but his elected successors very quickly created their first state in Yemen. They even, in the 700s, took control of Mecca and Medina for a little while. Missionaries spread their message to Algeria, where they created the Rustamid dynasty, and they could also be found in Sindh, Zanzibar, and even Sicily. But they largely formed a base in Oman after creating an imamate there in the 8th century. An imamate, by the way, is just a theological state controlled by an imam or a leader of a certain sect. As for the other titles that will keep popping up, a sultan is the highest civil office, and therefore a largely secular role, more like a European king. And a caliph is the highest of both the religious and secular spheres, and seen to be sort of a successor of Muhammad, or leader of the entire Islamic world. There are of course a bunch of other titles in the Islamic world, like an emir. This was originally just a title in the army, but over time it referred to the leader of a country that declared their allegiance to a larger caliph. So the emir of Bani Khalid would recognize the caliph in the Ottoman Empire, so we could sort of compare it to a principality. While today there's also many sheikhs, but this is uniquely Arabian and is used to refer to a tribal elder. But over time this title began to be bestowed upon leaders of various states in the Gulf region. But going back to the Abadis, I bring them up first as a simple way to show just how quickly a religious sect could spread in the Islamic world. This wasn't like in Christian Europe, where you could almost draw dividing lines between Catholic and Protestant on the map. In the Islamic world, a sect may begin somewhere like Iraq, become the official religion of a state in Yemen, then a century later, pop up in Zanzibar in Spain, before finding a new home in North Africa. This will be true for most of the Shia sects as well. The early Shias continued to fight for Ali's family, believing that the spiritual leaders could only come from Muhammad's family. These leaders, the Imams, formed a somewhat unbroken line for a while. However, more disputes over succession emerged, and therefore more sects were created. Like in the 8th century, when Imam Jafar al-Sadiq died. One group formed the Ismaili sect, believing that the rightful successor was Ismail. This was, for many centuries, the largest Shia sect. And it was even the official religion of the Fatimids in Egypt. This dynasty was even named after Muhammad's daughter Fatima, who they claimed to be descended from. The Ismailis, however, had even more divisions, 
like in the 11th century, there was a power struggle and two new sects emerged, Nizari and Mustali, the Nizari Ismaili followers you may have heard of before. As once the Fatimids fell, they, from their mountain castles, formed the Order of Assassins. They also believe that there is an unbroken line of Imams right up until today. However, their Imam currently lives in Portugal, and after being persecuted by the Mongols, Seljuks and the likes, they found a new base in Tajikistan. There, around Korog, is the only real majority Ismaili area. While back in Cairo, when the Ismailis ruled, there was another sect that emerged, known as the Druze. Their history goes back to a sultan known as Al-Hakim, who began to spread the message that he was a prophet of sorts. One man named Al-Darazi even claimed that Al-Hakim was a god. But this was declared a heresy, yet it's believed that's where the Druze got their name from, Darazi. They however refer to themselves as Unitarians, as they believe in a mix of different religions. For instance, Saint George is an important figure in their religion, and although it's an Abrahamic religion, they believe in reincarnation, and many are said to be reborn in China if they achieve a certain level of purification. But after their initial proselytizing missions, they accepted no other converts into the religion, and only reincarnated Druze will be Druze. As for Al-Hakim, he mysteriously disappeared, possibly assassinated while out in the desert. But the Druze believe that he went into occultation, which just means he removed himself from the world of humans, but will reappear when the end of time comes. Today, however, the Druze have found a new home in the Levant, especially around Lebanon, after they were chased out of Egypt. But going back to this idea of a leader entering occultation, this idea is shared by many Shia Muslims, like the most popular branch of Shia Islam, the Twelvers. They believe that the title of Imam was passed from Ali to his son Hussein, and on and on down to Al Askari. He, however, was believed to have been killed by the Abbasids. But there's a belief that he had a son, Muhammad al Mahdi. This son was kept hidden to prevent him from being killed, thus making him the 12th Imam. His birth is said to somewhat mirror the life of Jesus and Moses, inasmuch as he was saved as a child. And, almost like Jesus, he is set to return to the world shortly before the Day of Judgment. In fact, some believe he will be joined by Jesus to restore the world to the true version of Islam. This sect of Islam had very few followers for most of its history. That was until Ishmael and his Safavids conquered Persia in the early 1500s. But Ishmael and most of Persia had in fact been Sunni for centuries. The Safavids were actually an order of Sunni Sufis, but over time, they began to form an alliance with the Kizil Bash, a group of Shia Turkic people. With their help, he took over their country and agreed to convert to their sect of Shia Islam. It should be said though that there are a few reasons as to why he converted. For starters, by converting to Shia Islam, he could present himself as both a political and a religious leader. Others argue he just wanted to create a unique identity for the Persians to counter the Ottomans, and this would create a further sense of unity in a nation made up of various ethnicities. So the sect became the mandatory religion of Persia. People were forcibly converted, Sunni mosques were destroyed, and remaining Sunnis were killed. But this still isn't the oldest Shia branch. That was created in the 8th century when Zaid ibn Ali, the grandson of Ali, led a revolt against the Umayyads. This failed, but those that supported him formed the Zaidiya sect. This sect rejects many Shia ideas, like the idea of a hidden imam, and it's more open to interpretation. So sometimes it's even referred to as the fifth school of Sunni, but I'll get onto those other four schools in a bit. In the 9th century, an imam traveled into Yemen, and there they set up a base. The old kings of Yemen followed the Zaidi sect, and today the Houthis of Yemen, currently fighting against the Sunnis, follow this branch of Shia Islam. There's also another branch of Shia Islam that's a little hard to describe, but you may have heard of them. They're known as the Alawites. This, despite being the minority religion of Syria, is the sect of the Assad family. Their history, however, is a little mysterious. Some argue it was created by Ibn Nusayr, who was a disciple of the 10th and the 11th Shia Imams. He then declared himself to be the Bab, or the Gateway of Truth. So, until the French arrived, they were called the Nusairis. But others say that they were pagans who adopted Christianity and only later Islam. However, they kept many of their old beliefs. 
like they believe that God has revealed himself numerous times to humanity in the form of a trinity. Some of these trinities include the likes of Plato and Socrates. But the final trinity included Ali, Muhammad, and the Persian disciple of Muhammad, Salman al-Farisi. They also believe in transmigration. This is when souls of wicked people may pass onto the bodies of dogs and pigs. And they continue to celebrate old Christian holidays like Christmas and even ancient Mesopotamian and Zoroastrian traditions. So throughout all of their history, they've been considered heretics. Now, you may notice that quite a few branches believe that the end of the world is coming and there will be a savior. This has real implications in history and it's important to keep in mind. For instance, in the 9th century, the Ismaili Karmatians seized Bahrain. They believed that the end of the world was inevitable and went on a rampage across Arabia. They sacked Baghdad and they even sacked Mecca in 930. They even stole the black stone from the Kaaba and filled the holy Zamzam well with the corpses of murdered pilgrims. They began following a Persian named Al Ishfahani, who they believed was God incarnate. In some reports, he almost seems to be bringing them back to Zoroastrians, but in others, he is referred to as the Mahdi. This belief in the Mahdi changes somewhat between the sects. But in short, the story says that the world will be filled with anarchy and chaos, and the Dajjal would appear. This is a one-eyed giant who will claim to be the savior, but he will just bring about chaos with an army of the children of prostitutes and Jewish people. But then the Mahdi would appear, leading an army bearing black banners. Jesus will then appear in Damascus and personally kill the Dajjal. Both Jesus and the Mahdi would then die, evil would reappear, but then the world would end. This belief that the world would end soon or experience a great change is called millenarianism. And again, when looking at the history of Islam, it's vital to keep in mind. Numerous people have claimed to be the Mahdi throughout history, most notably in Sudan in the 19th century, starting the Mahdist Wars with Britain. But also in the 1400s, Muhammad Janpuri claimed it in India. He even started his own sect known as the Mahdavi. They were forced out of the region by the British, but today they actually have a center over in Chicago. There's even a Mahdist sect in Baluchistan in Pakistan known as Zikri. They believe that a Mahdist figure known as Nur Pak was around at the time of Adam and will return to bring back the true version of Islam. Nur Pak was allegedly born in the 16th century and they claim that it was not Jang Puri, although some others claim that they were in fact the same people. More recently, in 1979, followers of one Mahdi seized the Grand Mosque of Mecca. And more recently still, the Iraqi government has revealed that they had hundreds of Mahdi claimants in their prisons. But moving on to Sunni Islam, they don't really have sects as such, but rather schools of thought. Their goal is to try to live as close to the Prophet as possible, but this is easier said than done. There's obviously the Quran as guidance, but there's also historic traditions and hadiths statements and reports made on the Prophet, some of which can be trusted, some of which cannot. Plus, they need to adapt all of these teachings to new problems that would not be mentioned in the Quran. The Hanafi school was the first to try to deal with all of these problems. This emerged in Iraq, and it favors a more rational approach to texts, looking at the reasons behind certain passages and debating them. This, they hoped, would lead them to the correct outcome, rather than just following a single, possibly unreliable, hadith. But then came the Maliki school, and that emerged in Medina. This draws more on the Sunnah, the traditions and practices of the Prophet, or, more likely, the people of Medina. The Shafi school came next, trying to bridge the gaps between the different schools. All of the hadiths were collected and categorized by reliability. To try and build up their school of thought, they disregarded the weak hadiths and only focused on the reliable ones. Finally came the Hanabali. They are taught that the Quran is the chief source of information and there is far less room for interpretation. This school of thought is predominant in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and they consider themselves to be the purer version of Islam. But there's no real fights between these different groups. They just have different interpretations on the rules. For instance, when it comes to praying, they may hold their hands in different places or they'll have different rules when it comes to seafood. Like the Hanbal and Shafi said all seafood is okay. The Malik says everything except eel is okay, while Hanafi said only fish is halal. 
but you may have heard of other versions of Sunni Islam, known as the Salafists or the Wahhabis. These are often used interchangeably, but there is a difference. Salafists try to recreate the original version of Islam, or in other words, they reject the four schools which came after the Prophet and the early Caliphs. But this is a pretty vague idea, and can apply to a great number of Muslims. Anybody who may want to live like the Prophet could be described as a Salafist. The Wahhabis are just a branch of the Salafists, but they are not the only one. Wahhabism was created in the 18th century by a preacher named Al-Wahhab, who made a pact with the House of Saud. The Saud family would take over the ruling of a new state, the Saudi state, while he would look after the religious ideology. But he actually studied the writings of Ibn Taymiyyah, a medieval scholar who argued against many folk practices that emerged in Islam, like the worship of tomb shrines and saint veneration. He also believed that through takfir, you could declare other Muslims to be non-believers if they didn't follow the religion correctly, and then you could declare jihad on them. Now, he wrote during the time of the Mongol invasions. So, you can draw some connections between his writings and the dawn of Salafism in later history. Al-Wahhab and many other thinkers during the Islamic revival were writing when the Islamic empires were on the decline and suffering from invasions, this time though from the Europeans. For instance, Shah Wali Ula Dailawi was a contemporary of Al-Wahhab, but he was writing over in India. He would actually go on to spread a similar Salafist belief, but he came from the Hanafi school. His school of thought would go on to form the Deobandi movement. Their focus, again, was on returning to the old ways, to bring about salvation, but it was also heavily linked to the anti-colonial movement. Over time, though, it became more popular in independent Pakistan, and from there it spread over the border into Afghanistan, where it became the dominant belief of the Taliban. However, the Saudi Wahhabis do spread their ideology in Deobandi Madras so it's very complicated and often overlaps. There is something though that both of these ideas and much of Shia Islam reject though, and that's Sufism. This is not a sect of Islam, but rather a different way of practicing it. There are in fact both Sunni and Shia Sufis. Some you may know already, like the whirling dervish of Turkey and Sudan, who are just a specific version of Sufism. Others describe Sufis as being a more mystic version of Islam, or maybe a more introspective version, where people look for God within. To do this, Sufis can do various things like dance in a group, or even sort of a version of chanting meditation. For simplicity's sake, and only for simplicity's sake, you can compare it to the medieval Christian monks chanting in their monasteries, or like many of the Buddhist practices. Yet again though, they are not a sect of Islam, they just believe in worshipping Islam differently. One of their group that is quite hard to pin down are the Alevis. They are a collection of Shia Muslims, primarily in Turkey, that follow the teachings of a mystic named Haji Bektashveli. Many claim that their religion comes from pre-Islamic roots. After all, they were originally Turkic migrants, and they may have brought many of their shamanistic practices from Central Asia. So they have actually been persecuted for most of their history. But they are just one of the many different types of Sufis you could find. So, if we were to divide the Middle East according to the Islamic faith, this is what it would look like. But then again, at the beginning of the 20th century, there were a whole host of other religions. Christianity obviously still has a major following in the Middle East today, but before World War I, this was far larger. Huge chunks of Western Anatolia were made up of ethnic Greek Christians, while the East was filled with Armenian Christians. Now I should interject and say with any of these, the percentage of people who were Christian, Sunni, Shia, Greek, Armenian, Turkic, etc., is sometimes speculative. It is also very often contested, and more likely than not, incredibly complicated. Plus, through genocides, repressions, migrations and the likes, the numbers vary widely over time. Just sticking with the Armenians, they made up probably 40% of the Van Vilayet, 30% of Bitlis, and 20% of Izmit on the other side of Anatolia. But this was at the outbreak of World War I, already after repressive campaigns had been launched. Or, if you take Jerusalem, every report in the 19th century provided radically different population records. Most agree that the city had between 15 and 20,000 people. But in 1856, an Austrian travel writer said, 9,000 were Muslim, 
3,000 were Christian and 6,000 were Jews. In the 1860s though, a British travel writer reported 8,000 Jews, 4,000 Muslims and 4,000 Christians. The Karl Baedeker travel guide in 1871 then reported 13,000 Muslims, 4,000 Jews and 7,000 Christians, while the British consul said there were 10,000 Jews, 5,000 Muslims and 5,500 Christians. You can keep on replicating this across the region, so take this map with a huge grain of salt. As for other Christians, in Syria and Iraq, there is a complicated web of churches which fall under the larger branch of Syrian Christianity. This is one of the oldest branches of Christianity and at one point was equal to the Greek and Latin churches. So the history of this church is long and as you'd expect complicated. They first became independent in the 5th century when a man named Nestorius challenged the church doctrine over the nature of Jesus. His followers in the East formed the Eastern Church or the Nestorian Church, which spread quickly, even as far away as China, India and Mongolia. But slowly their importance waned, until in the Middle East, their only real followers were the Assyrians. These were the descendants of ancient Assyrians and, although they were surrounded by Muslims, maintained their Christian faith. This is largely around cities like Aleppo, Mosul and Baghdad and up in the Kurdish mountains. From the Crusades up until the 1700s, many Syriacs began to form closer relations with Rome and favoured joining back with them. So they formed the Syriac Catholic Church, while those who refused to join continued on with the Syriac Orthodox Church. But over in nearby Lebanon, about one third of their population is Christian, however most of them are Maronites. This branch of Christianity was created by a hermit named Maron. They found a new home isolated around Mount Lebanon, where, after the Arab invasions, they became independent from the Church of Antioch. The church in Antioch did remain though, and it became a bit of a blend of different ideas. Their liturgy had clearly been influenced by the Byzantine church, however they also kept communication with Rome. And in the 1700s, some joined the Catholic church, forming the Greek Melkite Catholic Church. They now can be found across the Middle East, but at the turn of the 20th century, many could be found in Palestine, Syria and Lebanon. Now, I should say the church in Antioch was one of the five ancient churches of Christianity. There was Constantinople, Rome, Antioch, Jerusalem and Alexandria. But as for Alexandria, they governed over the Coptic Christians of Egypt. Coptic actually just means Egyptian and their branch of Christianity broke away in the 400s, once again arguing over the nature of Jesus. Under Byzantine rule they were actually persecuted quite a bit, so many actually welcomed the Islamic invasion of Egypt. So there are some of the Christian groups in the Middle East, however let's move on to the Jewish people. They obviously had a community in the Middle East since ancient times. Besides Jerusalem, Babylon had actually been a centre of Jewish learning for thousands of years. In fact, even when Muhammad took over Medina, there was a Jewish community there. Many Jews did flee to Europe once the Romans destroyed the Temple of Jerusalem, but many did stay in the Middle East. Then over time more Jewish groups began to reappear in the Middle East, like the Shephardic, who fled Christian Spain at the end of the Reconquista. Then in the 1700s, the first Ashkenazi families moved from Lithuania to Jerusalem. Along with the Holy Land and Babylon, they also had large populations in Istanbul, Alexandria, Tunis, Izmir and even the Caucasus, where under Russian rule they were called the Mountain Jews. But if you were to actually begin to divide places on religious grounds, including sects, well in the early 20th century, Baghdad would have been a Jewish city. They accounted for 88,000 out of 200,000 people, while Christians made up 12,000. There were obviously more Muslims at over 100,000, but they were split between Sunni and Shia. And although today the city is majority Shia, this wasn't the case 100 years ago, as it was largely a Sunni city. Otherwise, the Jewish people in the Middle East even had their own versions of millenarianism. Sabati Zevi in the 1600s claimed to be the Jewish Messiah, and by all reports, seems to have had a following across Europe. Even in England, a German diplomat wrote, all the world here is talking of a rumour of the return of the Israelites to their own country. But to continue adding to this extensive list, there's also the Mandaeans, who believe that John the Baptist was in fact the final prophet. This group is possibly the last and only remaining followers of Gnosticism. 
this ethno-religious group used to have 70,000 or so followers in Iraq until very recently. Otherwise, in the middle of the 19th century, there was a new prophet known as the Bab. He went around Persia declaring that all prophets were just different manifestations of God. He wasn't even the first Persian to do this, as centuries earlier, a prophet named Mani created the incredibly influential religion known as Manichaeism. This, at one point, had followers in the Roman Empire and China. One of the Bab's followers, known as Baha'u'llah, tried to assassinate the Shah, so the religion was persecuted. However, after years underground, it re-emerged as the Baha'i Faith. Zoroastrianism as well, the religion of ancient Persia, had survived. Many fled to India, where they are called Parsis, but even in the Middle East, there are still tens of thousands of them. They still even had fire temples in operation, especially in Azerbaijan, until very recently. Sticking in Persia, you also have the Yasani, who claim that they were around long before all other religions, although the Muslims say that theirs is just a heresy of Islam. They believe in one god who reappears on earth, and the most recent incarnation was a Kurd named Sultan Sahak, who lived in the Middle Ages. But trying to sort out what is fact on this religion is quite difficult. In some ways, their views of an inner and outer world are somewhat similar to that of the Sufis, but that is very, very simplistic. As for other religions over in Israel, there are the Samaritans, who I'm sure you've heard of. In many ways, they are quite similar to the Jews, as they lived in Canaan in ancient times, they follow some of the books in the Torah, and even call themselves the children of Israel. However, they believe that Mount Gerizim, not Mount Zion, is the home of God. The Jews actually hated this group for a very long time. For instance, they destroyed their temple on Mount Gerizim, and then there's the famous parable of the Good Samaritan. In Iraq, there's also the Yazidi in the north. They believe that they were created separately to the rest of humanity by a supreme creator God. But he sent seven divine beings to govern over the universe. The most important is a peacock angel. But many outside of their religion refer to this belief in fallen angels as a form of devil worship. The Yazidis seem to have emerged some time around the 12th century from a branch of Sufism. But over time, they merged together some of their older beliefs with Islam to create their own ideas. Again, it's very hard to pin down exact beliefs when describing these small, often persecuted groups. But if we were to divide the Middle East according to religion, it would look something like this. But then, of course, to make it even more complicated, there's ethnicity. To try and briefly sum this up, we could divide people along language lines. Semitic. Semitic, like the Arabs. Iranic, like the Persians and Kurds. The Turkic people. The Caucasic, like the Circassian and Georgian. And smaller groups, like the Greek. And even speakers of Cushitic languages, like the Beja people of Egypt. I've already mentioned the Arabs, so let's start with the Turkic people. They came from the east from the borders of China sometimes as invaders, sometimes as refugees. They can obviously be found in Anatolia, but also in Iran, with groups like the Kashkai in the south and the Aziri in the north. But there's even smaller groups like the Afshars, who are nomadic, but created the short-lived Afshara dynasty in Persia. This was ruled over by Nadia Shah, who attacked the Mughals and sacked Delhi. In Iraq, the Turkic people also made up a sizable chunk of cities like Kurkut, and Turkey, for a long time, had some sort of claim to this territory. While pushing out further east, the north of Afghanistan is made up of groups like the Turkmens and Uzbeks, both of which are Turkic people. In fact, in the 19th century, right up until today, there has been a movement to unite all of the Turkic people together into one nation. However, in modern-day Turkey, there's still a bit of a distinction between the Turks and the Turkmens that came later. These Turkic people lived side by side in many places with the Iranic people, like the Persians and the Kurds. The Persians clearly are those descended from the old empire, but the Kurds have a completely mysterious origin. Some claim they are descendants of the old empire of Medes. Others say that they are a mix of various groups, while others say they are just nomads. The Kurds we can break down into different tribes, and even among the Persians, there are still smaller groups, like the Lurs people in the south, the Mazanis and the Galaks in the north. The Baluch people are also an Iranian group, and they again have a mysterious origin. But it seems that they travelled from the west, potentially as far away as Syria, through Persia, to find their new home on the Pakistani-Iranian borders. To the north of them, there are the Pashtuns. 
They live in an area which was once home to the Bactrian Sogdians and even the Greeks for a little while. These various Pashtun tribes were united by Ahmad Shah Durrani, who created his own empire. This empire even conquered lands from the Persians after the fall of Nadir Shah. Further north still, there's the Hazaras. They have remained Shia in a largely Sunni Afghanistan. So, as you'd expect, they remain one of the most persecuted groups in the country. Like other groups, their origin is disputed, so more than likely, they're a mix of different ethnicities. As for the rest of Afghanistan, it's made up of different groups like the Tajiks. Then, even within most of the largely Arabic countries, there's still huge differences between an Arab in Sudan and an Arab in Iraq, for instance. But you can still find other ethnicities in these countries. The Berbers, who were in North Africa long before the Arabs, still live in places like Morocco. And one of their offshoots, the Touaregs, seek independence from Algeria and Libya. The Tubo people also inhabit southern Libya as well. In southern Egypt, there's the Nubians, who continue to suffer from some pretty overt racism today. Like TV presenter Tamir Amin suggested on TV, that the Nubians should raise their children to become servants. And this view of the Nubians as somehow lesser Egyptians has been shared by many throughout history. Nearby are the Beja people, who also live in Sudan. They are largely nomadic, and their Cushitic language makes them closer to the Somalis than the Arabs. But just sticking on Egypt for a moment, as they provide a good example for something common in Muslim countries. They were rarely ruled by the locals. Egypt never really had an Egyptian ruler for over 2,000 years. This would also be sort of true in Persia as well, with the Turkic Qajar dynasty, Kurdish Zan dynasty and more. But in Egypt, their rulers were Persian, Macedonian, Roman, Byzantine and Arab. Even the Ayyubid dynasty, which Saladin ruled over, was Kurdish. The Mamluks came in next, and they were a military caste of many Georgians and Circassians. They had often been taken as slaves by Islamic rulers, forced to convert, and then they formed the basis of the militaries and even government. They were similar to the Janissaries, who are possibly the most famous of these foreign slave soldiers, but really, these slave soldiers have been present throughout Islamic history. After the Mamluks came the Turkic Ottomans, and after them, Muhammad Ali Pasha, the Albanian, and only in the 20th century, with the rise of Nasser, did an Egyptian rule Egypt. The Albanians that Muhammad Ali Pasha came from, by the way, didn't belong to the Janissaries. They were Bashi Bazouk, a group of irregular troops which were quite notoriously cruel, especially in putting down rebellions like in Bulgaria. They were often Albanian, but could also be black Africans. Egypt, like most of the Muslim world, had a booming trade in African slaves, right the way up into the 20th century, and in some places still continues today. In some places like Saudi Arabia, Afro-Arabs make up 10% of the population. And important leaders like Saad al-Salim al-Sabah, who ruled Kuwait in 2006, was the son of an enslaved Ethiopian. In the Ottoman Empire, there are reports of African quarters in cities like Izmir, However, many of them were castrated, so the population of Afro-Turks today is just a few thousand. Moving across into the Levant and Iraq, there were various ethno-religious groups like the Yazidi and the Druze, but like with elsewhere, they were joined by a number of Jews migrating from Europe long before the Zionist movement even kicked off. The Circassians also moved into the region as well in the 19th century, and as I mentioned before, they resettled in the city of Amman. They, however, had long been slaves across the Middle East, and formed the basis of many of the slave armies. They were also joined by Crimean Tatars that were fleeing the Russian Empire, and today there's about 5 million of them in Turkey. They settled in the centre of Anatolia, while to the north, that was inhabited by a huge mix of people. The Greeks had remained there since ancient times, while in the countryside around them are the Caucasian Laz people. The Armenians, also prior to the genocide, formed the majority in half of eastern Anatolia. And you can zoom into pretty much any region or city and find other groups. Like in Istanbul, there were Muslims, Greeks, Armenians, a few thousand Bulgarians, tens of thousands of Jews, and even a couple thousand Latins. These were the descendants of Italians that lived in the city since the days of the Byzantine Empire, and still today, they have their own churches. So if you put the ethnicities together with the tribes and religions, you can see it's hard to draw an obvious border. Now you may ask with all of these divisions, why not just keep to the old borders? However, problems were brewing within nearly every province for centuries. 
long before the collapse of the Ottoman Empire.